can we focus a bit and just define for those who may not be familiar with it, what is cognitive poetics? And maybe if I could add to that question as well, what would you say is the difference between cognitive poetics and cognitive linguistics? Is one a subset of the other? Uh, I guess so, yeah. So, I mean, well, it, there's, there's another sort of hierarchy above that. So I guess cognitive science, broadly speaking, I would include cognitive linguistics, cognitive psychology, uh, some neuropsychology. Um, so all of that stuff would be in, under the, the, the broad umbrella of cognitive science, which really, I think, transformed as a sort of paradigm shift most areas of human inquiry, especially into the brain and the mind um, through the 1980s and 90s. So that, that was the big shift. Um, cognitive linguistics is, is a, a, a main a branch of that um, and the, 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 the shade in between cognitive linguistics and cognitive psychology actually I think start to blur into each other in that you know it's quite hard to talk about linguistics without thinking about what your what your mind is doing with bits of language um, so there's a there's a connection between those two um, for me as a statistician I've always I was always interested uh, in looking at literature using our best current knowledge of language and mind and you know in our era that means cognitive linguistics it, it is the best way of looking at language and mind uh so you know about seven or eight years ago I wrote a book on surrealism and was looking at the 1920s surrealists and actually they were doing the same thing so their current best knowledge of language and mind at the time was freudian psychoanalysis mm -hmm. so they, they regarded themselves as researchers not as artists um and i think actually i'm doing the same thing and we now know that you know that sort of psychoanalytical model of the mind is is uh, is not accurate or is problematic or is historically interesting but not not doesn't work as well um so cognitive poetics very simply is is the application of our best current knowledge of language and mind which is cognitive science to matters of literature and whether that's creativity uh design patterning textual organization reading uh, the effect of reading um the socialization of reading so all of those aspects of, of literary study i think that have always been part of literary criticism um that's the object of study and it's it's simply trying to account for that stuff in a way that's as near as possible uh aligned with the principles of cognitive science you've already told me how you became interested in cognitive poetics do you have anything to add to that I should say that the phrase is not mine. Uh, people often cite my 2002, it was a textbook really, uh, uh, for, as, as, as coining the phrase, but actually the, the Israeli scholar Reuven Sir had been using it, or in fact invented this, the, the, the phrase back in the 1970s. Um, okay. And then uh, through the 90s, um, when, when, whenever I came across people applying cognitive principles or, or cognitive science to literary text, yeah. people were just naturally calling it cognitive poetics um, mm -hmm. they're also calling it things like cognitive rhetoric or, or co cognitive approach to literature and, and so on there's lots of different phrases um, and i think cognitive poetics has probably stuck just because i made it the title of the textbook but right. it's yeah. almost a finger in the air that it could could have been called anything um, yeah. and in oh. fact people since like margaret freeman uh, the 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 um anyway uh, a North American scholar has uh, has talked has said you know what we actually should be talking about is is the poetics of cognition not not sort of cognitive poetics yeah. which I think is an interesting uh, reversal of that yeah what aspect of cognitive poetics have you found to be the biggest payoff in your your reading of texts it's a funny one that because as a, as a as a stylistician you often use the metaphor of the sort of toolbox you know so whichever literary text you need to be thinking about or talking about you you, you pick out the tool from the toolkit that the best accounts for that so um you know in a, in a in a text that's sort of heavily metaphorical or in which there's lots of extended metaphors or interest in novel or peculiar metaphors you would you would reach for i don't know sort of lay coffee and conceptual metaphor theory to talk about that um so I suppose it's the answer is it depends on what the text is. Having said that, I do find myself coming back over and over again to, to text world theory uh, established by Paul Worth in, in the late 1980s, uh, but subsequently adapted by people including Joanna Gavins and others. Um, and text world theory is great for a, 
for a uh, stylistician because it has it's it's a theory of of uh, discourse processing so it, it has the sort of general sense of how you build a world in your head uh, and how that world advances when you read a text mm -hmm. um, but it also crucially and unlike other sort of world level approaches it nails the analysis down to the text as well to the actual stylistic expression of the text mm -hmm. so for text world theory um the question of how do you know which bits of knowledge you need on this occasion, uh, which is actually quite a difficult question, um, is answered by Paul Worth, who says the text tells you it's all about which bit of the style is making you draw down certain parts of your knowledge. Um, yeah. And you use that to flesh out the text mm -hmm. uh, or flesh out your reading. Mm -hmm. And that, I found that really productive model, not just for, for obvious things like talking about fictionality or alternativity or you know, because I, I, I'm still a big science fiction fantasy fan, um, mm -hmm. but also for being able to talk about uh, emotional uh, identification across world boundaries or um, a feeling of immersion uh, mm -hmm. or most recently a feeling of ethics. You know, mm -hmm. so how how is this other world, the world which should be or shouldn't be, how does that map onto the world as it is? Um, so I find textual theory particularly productive uh, in, in all sorts of ways. Yeah. Yeah, and that I, that seems to be a nice connection to a narrative, which is what we're concerned about on this uh, this blog website is looking at narratives and especially ancient narratives. And I imagine that text world theory would be particularly helpful in looking at narrative texts and ways that people tell stories. Yeah, absolutely, because it, it it's it's able to talk about things beyond the the, the local, you know, beyond the, the the small excerpts. You can talk about a whole narrative arc or or the way that texts develop. Um, and, and, and of course, you, you, when you're reading a long narrative, part of the, 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 the basic um, capacity that you need as a reader is to keep track of what's going on. Uh, you know, so you, 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 you build a world or the text helps you build a world in, initially. Um, and then that's been refined all the time. But you use that world to interpret the incoming stuff that you're coming across later in the reading. Um, yeah. So it's a very sort of dynamic model as well, which I like. Uh, you know, quite a lot of classical narratology is pretty sort of structuralist and fixed, isn't it? Um, and I think, you know, there's another field, narratology, that was completely transformed by the cognitive term. Um, in fact, on that very same bus uh, going across uh, the, 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 uh, the cabbage fields of Hungary, um, I was sitting behind two, two academics. Uh, one was a prag pragma pragmatician and the other was a critical theorist. Um, and they were both uh, saying, oh, well, you know, narratology was finished, uh, not because it had failed, but because it was completely successful, that it had mm. now explained everything that could possibly be explainable in narrative. So there was no point in doing it anymore. Um, there was no more innovation to be had in narratology uh, because it, had, it was able to do everything. And mm. I think, you know, what, what changed around then was a, a, an absolute revivification of the field. Um, on the basis of being able to talk about not so much you know fixed structural elements but but this this idea that uh, that both both creative design and uh sort of re readily readily processing were were the core core interest of, of narrative and narratology i came across someone uh, who was trying to figure out what they wanted to do for a dissertation, perhaps uh, when they applied for doctoral studies in uh, New Testament. And they had someone tell them, uh, a senior scholar in the field say, well, don't do the gospels because um, there's nothing else to do in the gospels. <laughs> and I feel like this, for me, this whole field of, of, of mind science of cognitive science and the very kind of thing you're talking about and especially thinking about uh responses how we can streamline or bring nuance to ways people receive texts in the ancient world and uh, and and through to today can can really benefit from uh, and thinking about how narratives work uh, mm -hmm. in in communication and in meaning making yeah, absolutely. i feel like there's yeah. a lot to do yeah yeah I mean, it's not, it's not only about having a better understanding of how narratives work in general, you know, I mean, and that's, that's a valuable thing. Um, but it's also, you know, I'm always interested in how does this narrative work? How does this particular text do something which is 
generic and uh, that you can draw down from your general sense, uh, mm -hmm. but also how is it doing something different? How is, mm -hmm. how is this narrative different from this narrative, right. even though it might superficially look the same? Why, yeah. why does it feel different? You know, yeah. why does it have a different emotional effect on you? Why, why, does, why do you draw different conclusions from this narrative rather than that one? Um, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm constantly interested, this is the stylistician in me, in, yeah. in what, what's, the, what's the, the detail difference? You know, how, how is that working? Yeah. No, that's, that's right. And that's something that, that using, I mean, structuralism is important and analyzing language is important. And, but that's something that just doing that alone can't answer those kinds of questions.